Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We are ready to start. Um, my name's Helen Pennant. I'm the Vice President of Clare Hall. Um, as Vice President's first job is always to give apologies for the President, Alan Short, uh, who is travelling for the college in Asia at the moment. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the King's Lecture, whether you are college members, Cambridge colleagues, or from further afield. Clare Hall established the King Lectures in 2016. The lectures were made possible uh, from a generous donation from Donald West King. Professor King was a pathologist from Yale, and he spent time with us as a visiting fellow and then a life member of Clare Hall. Since 2016, we've had many distinguished speakers, and this lecture has become an important part of the intellectual life of our college. This was Professor King's vision, and um, I have learned that when the original concept for the lectures was discussed, uh, Professor Doudna's name was mentioned. So tonight we're actually honoring uh, Professor King's wishes in welcoming her to give the lecture. Um, this year's lecture has been uh, arranged by Dr. Laurie Passmore, as in many previous years. Uh, Laurie is one of Clare Hall's most eminent fellows. She is a group leader of the Structural Studies Division um, at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, and she is a fellow of the Royal Society. I'm now going to hand over to Laurie to introduce Professor Dubner. Thank you very much, Helen, um, and uh, a very warm welcome to Jennifer, to her husband, Jamie Kate, and to all of you uh, for coming here today. And we're really very thankful to Jennifer and Jamie for taking time to spend uh, uh, several days in Cambridge and at Clare Hall. Now, Jennifer holds the Lee Cushing Chancellor's Chair in Biomedical and Health Sciences and is a professor of biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology at UC Berkeley in California. She's interested in studying how RNA controls cellular function, and more specifically, how RNAs control genetic information. Jennifer did her PhD with Jack Shostak at uh, Harvard University, her postdoc with Tom Chek at University of Boulder, Colorado, and started her own lab at Yale University. And during this time, much of her work was focused on understanding catalytic RNAs. Now Jennifer and Jamie uh, determined some of the first structures of RNA, showing that RNA can fold up into specific shapes, and show, they showed how the, these RNAs can catalyze reactions just like proteins. Jennifer moved to UC Berkeley in 2003, where she's made really important contributions to our understanding of RNA and RNA protein complexes, particularly in regulating gene expression. Just over uh, 10 years ago, Jennifer teamed up with Emmanuel Charpentier uh, to understand the role of a peculiar set of repetitive DNA elements in bacteria. And these turned out to be um, a part of a bacterial defense system, which acts to cut up foreign DNA and protect the bacteria. Jennifer immediately recognized that the system, CRISPR-Cas9, could be harnessed to, to very precisely edit DNA in any cell, including in human cells. So it's really difficult to overstate the importance of this discovery. CRISPR is used uh, routinely in scientific research, in biotechnology, and uh, very excitingly in medical um, and therapeutic applications. So Jennifer and Emmanuel Charpentier were awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work. So given the immense scope of this technology, Jennifer has had initiated and encouraged discussions on the ethics of genome editing, She's really passionate about the way, we do, uh, the way we do science, about mentoring, and about communicating with the public. 
This was really evident in her interactions with students in the scientific community today. Jennifer is an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She has many honors and awards to her name. Uh, just, just to name a few, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Inventors, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a foreign member of the Royal Society, and she's a recipient of the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the Gairdner International Award, the Kavli Prize, and the Wolf Prize in Medicine. She was recognized by Time as one of the 100 most influential people in 2015. And very recently, she's founded an innovative genomics, the Innovative Genomics Institute, which aims to harness genome engineering to solve some of humanity's uh, greatest problems. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Jennifer to the stage. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for those kind words and introduction. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to speak with you about our work on CRISPR. And I know and I can see that we have quite a few students here. So I'm, I'm particularly honored that, that the students are here. And um, I, for you, I really would like to share a bit about how we got involved in CRISPR and you know, kind of my a little bit about my my personal story with this field of science, and, and really to explain that, you know, for me, I've now been running my academic lab for almost 30 years, and I've found that over the years, we've worked on a number of different things, but it's really always been about curiosity-driven science, as, as Lori Passmore just said, and, and really with an eye towards evolution and the role of RNA molecules in particular in evolution. It was really through that broad interest that I got involved in CRISPR. It wasn't to develop a technology, but it was really to understand something uh, very fundamental in biology. So what I'm going to do tonight is three things. I'm going to first talk about uh, our engagement with CRISPR and uh, how it became a technology for genome editing. And then I want to tell you about, in particular, where we're at right now in this field of genome editing with regard to human health, because it's, it's a, it, as I'll tell you, it's a, it, we're at a very exciting moment, actually. And it's really kind of marking, in my mind, the beginning of what is going to be possible in the future with genome editing for therapeutics. And then I want to tell you a bit about where the field is headed, because for a technology like CRISPR, there are many opportunities that go beyond medicine as well. So the story of CRISPR, you know, I think is really, it's kind of emblematic of the way I feel about science in general, which is that you know, I think when, when scientific discoveries are made at any level, it's often uh, an a, uh, uh, intersection of opportunity, serendipity, and collaboration. And that was absolutely true for me uh, and for, for my coworkers with CRISPR. And the opportunity began in around 2007 or so when I had moved my lab from, from Yale to UC Berkeley in, in 2002. And shortly thereafter, I met Jill Banfield, who's shown here. So Jill is a scientist who researches bacteria, and she does so by doing bioinformatics. So she sequences the DNA found in microbes to figure out who they are, and importantly, also the kinds of viruses that infect these phage and it was through these uh, bacteria. And it was through that type of research that she had come across a lot of examples of curiously repetitive DNA elements in the genomes of many bacteria, not all, but quite a few. And furthermore, there was evidence that these uh, repetitive sequences that also had some unique inserted sequences within them, within them were adapting or changing over time in these bacteria. Something, you know, just a few scientists in the field at the time had noticed this and thought there might be something interesting going on. And so she actually reached out to me because she thought there might be a role for RNA in this, in this, uh, you know, in this biology. And furthermore, there was some evidence from research that was done by several other folks that are shown down here, especially Francisco Mojica, who suspected, they hypothesized, that these sequences which had come to be called CRISPRs were in fact 
the signatures of an adaptive immune system, bacteria that was RNA driven or RNA guided. So that's where my RNA background uh, came into play. And then the serendipity and collaboration came about because I uh, started to work on CRISPR systems with two wonderful scientists in the lab, Blake Wiedenheff and Rachel Horowitz, who began to you know, do biochemical experiments where they were purifying molecules that were part of this CRISPR pathway, as I'll share with you shortly, and, and figure out how they're working. And that led us, eventually led me, to a conference that I attended in 2011 when I met Emmanuel Charpentier, who's shown here. And when we met at that meeting, we started talking about our respective paths and interests that had take, brought us both to this meeting to talk about CRISPR. And we realized we had an opportunity to, to collaborate, to figure out a current mystery in the field, which was to really understand mechanistically, how is it that these pathways, which by that point had clearly emerged, at, you know, they were pretty clearly some kind of immune system that could prevent bacterial um, you know, killing by bacteriophage, but nobody really, really understood how, how it worked at that time. And so we realized we had an opportunity to try to figure that out together. And so I came back to my lab at Berkeley where Martin Yinek, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time, was working. And Martin was kind of at an interesting point in his research where he had done some very nice work on a, a different RNA-guided system called RNA interference, and he had about a year to go in my lab before he wanted to move on to his own independent work. And so he was kind of looking for an interesting thing to work on. And so I came back from the conference and I said, Martin, you know, I met this amazing scientist and I think we could do some experiments together to figure out this mystery in the field, which I'll explain to you. And he was very excited and one thing led to another and we very quickly got onto the system that ultimately led to the um, technology that's used for genome editing. And so what Martin started working on with, uh, in collaboration with Chris Chylinski, who was a student in Emmanuel's lab at the time, was really getting at one of the most fundamental aspects of biology, which is kind of illustrated here for bacteria, which is the, the ongoing interaction between organisms and the viruses that infect them. So I'm showing you here bacteria that are be, being infected by bacteriophage, so these uh, phage are viruses that literally sit down on the surface of these cells and inject their DNA and start taking over the cell and making more viruses, right? And so that, that's a process that in bacteria can kill these cells very, very quickly. So there's a lot of selective pressure for the cells to come up with ways to defend themselves. And that's exactly what CRISPR is. It's an example of a bacterial immune system, and we now know that there's lots of different ways that bacteria defend themselves, but, but, but CRISPR is, is really intriguing because it's, a, it's an adapted system. And so what emerged in the next, you know, sort of over time with uh, various kinds of genetic and, and biochemical and molecular biology experiments is that CRISPR is a pathway that allows cells to acquire immunity to bacteriophage, to viruses, in real time. And it's an RNA-guided system. So what I'm showing you here is a cartoon that illustrates the, the way this pathway works. So if a bacterial cell is infected by a virus, like this here, where, where the virus is injecting its genetic material, if the cell has a CRISPR system encoded in the genome, it can capture little segments of that foreign DNA and insert them into the genome of the bacterium not randomly, but in a very particular place called the CRISPR locus that has a series of short repetitive elements marked by these Rs, and between them the, are these inserted or spacer uh, sequences marked by S. So you get, you know, sort of a long array of these, and in some bacteria these can be dozens of units long, right? So they can have many, many different inserted sequences over time, and they can grow over time. And this is something uh, Jill Banfield has seen, is that these sequences can expand they can also contract, right? So it's very, very much a sort of an ongoing pathway. And what these sequences do is to provide a template for the cell to make copies of RNA molecules that serve as the molecular guides of CRISPR-associated proteins that are shown here. And it's this RNA-guided complex that searches the cell to identify foreign DNA that matches the sequence of the RNA guide, and that triggers DNA cleavage and ultimately 
DNA degradation. So in bacteria, it's a great way to acquire immunity and then destroy the invading nucleic acid. But in studying this, we figured out that uh, once we understood how this actually worked with this RNA-guided DNA cutting, we recognized that it could be harnessed for a different purpose in eukaryotic cells, meaning animal or plant or human cells, where DNA repair is much more uh, uh, robust and the cells are growing more slowly, so there's an opportunity to repair broken DNA, whereby this type of mechanism that introduces a double-strand break to DNA can actually trigger changes to the DNA sequence over time and in a precise fashion that's um, dictated by where the CRISPR-Cas9 system actually makes a double-stranded break. And just, you know, by the way, this is not, this didn't sort of come to us out of the blue either. There was a long history of people using double-stranded DNA breakage in these types of cells to induce genome editing. It's just that those earlier technologies were not very easy to implement because they involved protein-based recognition of DNA. What made CRISPR so powerful is that it's an RNA-guided system, so it makes it very easy to change the RNA guide, as I'll, as I'll show you. So when, when Martin Yannick and Chris Chylinski started working on this, they initially were doing biochemical experiments. So they were purifying the Cas9 protein and the RNA that guides it to DNA. And those experiments showed initially that this system is normally, naturally, a two-RNA-guided system. There's an RNA that comes from the CRISPR array, which has the information to find a matching sequence in DNA, so that's this green uh, bar right here. But importantly, a second type of RNA molecule is essential for this system to work, and it's an RNA called the tracer, which is shown in red. And it's that RNA that forms the molecular structure that allows assembly of this type of an interaction with DNA. And when the system interacts with a, a place in DNA that has complementarity to the RNA guide, the DNA is melted locally, so the two strands of that beautiful double helix of DNA melt apart, and that allows interaction of the RNA with one side of this uh, DNA sequence, triggering DNA cleavage by the Cas9 protein. So that generates double-stranded breaks. And Furthermore, as Martin Yinek in the lab was investigating the details of how this actually works, he figured out a couple of things that turned out to be very important for developing this as a technology. First of all, we realized that in addition to this 20 nucleotide sequence in DNA that matches the RNA guide, which is essential for the system to work, there was another aspect that was essential, and that is the presence of a little motif in the DNA adjacent to the target. So in this, for this enzyme, it's two GC base pairs. So this is a motif that we call the PAM sequence that is required for targeting. And I won't get into it tonight, but it's the reason it's there in, in bacteria is it's a, it's a mechanism that the bacteria can use to, to detect self from non-self, right? So it's a way that you know, all immune systems have to be able to figure out Am I targeting a really a, something that's foreign versus my own genome? And this is how it works in these bugs, is that they have this little tag that says, oh yeah, this is a foreign piece of DNA and you need to target it. And then for the RNA, you remember I told you that in nature, this is a two RNA guided system. But what we figured out, you know, being RNA biochemists and people who think a lot about RNA structure is we realized that it was pretty likely that these RNAs were close together in physical space, and furthermore, that we could actually link them together by making a continuous strand of DNA, that, uh, of RNA, this is RNA here, that would have the guide sequence on one end and the part of the RNA that's essential for recognition of the Cas9 protein on the other. And so Martin um, was excited to, to test this idea in the laboratory. So this was something that, you know, this was sort of an idea that came out of the initial uh, studies of this this protein and its guide RNA. And so I just wanted to show you two experiments that were done in those early days in the lab that, are, you know, as you'll see, are very simple experiments, and yet they were kind of profound for us at the time because they told us some information about the system that turned out to be very important for figuring out not only how it works as an immune system, but also how you could harness it as a technology. 
and this is the first experiment. So the idea here was to ask whether we could take RNA guides, and this would be doing it either in this fashion right here, which is analogous to what happens in bacteria, where we have the Cas9 protein and the CRISPR RNA, which is the guide, has the guide sequence in it, and the second RNA tracer here that's required for a function and assembly, or making guide RNAs that look like this, where we have a single form uh, guide RNA that has the targeting sequence and the assembly mechanism in the same molecule. We could do it either way. And so Martin did experiments where he designed five different guide RNAs that would allow cleavage of DNA at sequences that had a matching uh, sequence matching the guide RNA. So I'm showing you on the top what we envisioned that molecular structure might look like, where you'd have two DNA strands on the top and the PAM sequence here, the RNA guide uh, in, shown in yellow, and then the rest of the RNA over here. And so we were looking for evidence that you know, this would trigger a double-stranded DNA cutting. And so the experiment that he did to test this was to take DNA that uh, we could visualize by looking at its mobility in an electrophoretic gel system. And when we didn't add any RNA guide, but we had Cas9 protein present in that reaction tube, no cleavage of the DNA was detected. So the, you can see this uh, band corresponding to the full-length DNA molecule. But when we added any of these guide RNA, to the reaction, now we saw that the DNA is cut because we could detect faster migration on this gel system. So the, the DNA was getting cut with all of these different guides, so that was very cool, clearly an RNA-guided system. But the real question was, is this really programmable in the sense that are we actually detecting, are we actually getting cutting at precise sequences in the DNA? And to look at that, Martin did this experiment here where he took a plasmid, so this is a circular piece of DNA, and he incubated this plasmid DNA with a restriction enzyme called SAL1 that cuts the DNA at a particular site, together with Cas9, this CRISPR uh, protein, plus one of these different guide RNAs, shown down here, that we expected would cut the DNA at one of these positions. And then the experiment was to, the way we analyzed the result, was to test the migration of the resulting DNA fragments on this elect electrophoretic gel system. And hopefully, hopefully, you can see, it's not too uh, bright maybe, to see that there are five uh, fragments in each of the lanes corresponding to each of these different RNA guides that have different mobilities corresponding to different sizes. And try to imagine, especially for the students here, you know, you do this experiment and you, you know, you're looking at the result and you see these different fragments. And then, you know, I really still remember Martin and I leaning over the light box in the lab and seeing this and realizing that holy smokes, we have a programmable protein, and we know how to program it, right? And so this was really a fun moment because um, we also realized that with the format of the guide RNA being in a single, you know, single molecule of RNA, we had a two-component system that could pretty readily be reprogrammed and redeployed to cut different kinds of RNA, uh, kinds of DNA. And so I just want to show you a quick video that is a kind of an artist's rendition of how we imagine this working for genome editing, where you can put a nuclear localization signal on the Cas9 protein and then program it with different kinds of guide RNAs that send it into the nucleus of an animal or plant or human cell, where it can search the genome to find a sequence that matches the RNA guide. And when that occurs, we know this protein can melt open the DNA. That allows formation of an RNA-DNA helix inside the protein triggering DNA cleavage. So that's Cas9's job. And then this is where the actual editing occurs. So the broken ends of the DNA are then detected by repair enzymes in the cell. So they find these broken ends and they can seal them up in this example by making a small change in the DNA sequence right at the place of the break. And in other cases, depending on how this technology is implemented, one can also include a DNA template for repair, so that allows insertion of new genetic sequences at the site of the original double-stranded break. And as a result, this RNA-guided mechanism turns out to be really useful for all kinds of genetic manipulations inside of cells, not only gene disruptions or gene replacements, but also control of transcription, meaning control of the output of genes, 
and uh, detecting the presence of different kinds of RNA or DNA molecules by uh, diagnostic detection. And then finally, um, imaging, looking at being able to put dyes and, and other imaging agents onto particular sequences inside the genome of a single cell. And so this technology over the last, uh, just over a decade, 11 years, I guess, since we published this work originally in 2012, has become adopted, has been adopted globally for all of these types of applications because it's a very easily adaptable um, tool for manipulating genomes in a precise and programmable fashion using RNA. So, uh, you know, lots of, lots of amazing uh, science is, is, is going on using CRISPR, and it's something that's very interesting about the technology is that it's not just for research, right? It certainly opened the door to all kinds of fascinating basic research projects, but in addition, it's a tool that can also be harnessed as a, an actual therapeutic, right? So we can use it for medical applications, and, and I won't talk too much about it tonight, but it's also a powerful technology for agricultural manipulations. And I think that, you know, when I think about the global impact of CRISPR, at least in the near term, I really think it's going to be in agriculture, where we can make targeted changes to plants. Um, but along with that, incredible potential and capability comes profound risk. And that was clear to us pretty early on in the field. You know, and I remember in, I think it was, oh gosh, it was probably late 2014 that I opened up a journal in my office at Berkeley and read a paper in which scientists said they had used CRISPR to modify embryos of monkeys. And those embryos, those, those CRISPR edited embryos were implanted into a female monkey to create a pregnancy. And then the, the monkeys, the, the, the babies that were born had modified DNA in all of their cells and they could transmit those changes induced by CRISPR to future generations. This is heritable genome editing. And I read that paper and I thought, holy smokes, there's no reason why you can't, you could imagine not being able to do that also in human embryos. And that means that we really now have a technology in our hands that can be used to create heritable changes. So we as humans have a tool that allows us to rewrite our own code of life. And that just, it struck me as, as just kind of an amazing thing to think about. Um, but also potentially, um, you know, with lots of uh, potential ethical uh, challenges. And so as a re result of that and lots of conversations that I was having with my colleagues at Berkeley at the time, uh, we, ha we had started a, a, an institute called the Innovative Genomics Institute that Lori mentioned. And in that context, we held a small meeting at the beginning of 2015 where we brought together a group of scientists who were experts in in vitro fertilization, human reproduction, uh, people who had been doing other kinds of genome editing in their research. And we, we tackled this, you know, we discussed this challenge of, you know, what do you do when you have a technology that allows you to make heritable uh, changes in the human genome? And, you know, sh should we do that? And if, if, if we should, you know, how should we do it? And, you know, and all those kinds of questions. And as a result of that very small meeting, we got the national academies in the U.S. and the Royal Society interested in this, and ultimately also the some of the um, scientific academies in other countries, including in China, who have now been holding regular international meetings on this topic. And the most recent one was in London earlier this year. And these um, meetings have resulted in reports like this one that have really dug into the current state of the science, as well as the, you know, all of the other aspects of this field that come into play, whether they are uh, legal, societal, ethical, you know, what, are, what are all the things that we have to think about if we're going to use CRISPR in this fashion? And, uh, and you may know that, you know, in fact, it was at the second meeting of that group in Hong Kong in 2018 that a scientist announced that he had, in fact, used CRISPR in human embryos, and those embryos had been implanted to create a pregnancy, and the girls that were born from that pregnancy had CRISPR-modified DNA. And this was, you know, it was quite, quite shocking at the time, although, you know, for those of us that were in the field, we knew that this was, a, was certainly a possibility. And I think what happened was very interesting, is that, you know, there was sort of an immediate international backlash against this. You know, 
you know, people recognized that it was really performed unethically. There was not a justifiable medical reason for the, the work that was done. And as a result, that scientist's lab was closed. He was jailed for several years. And, and around the world, I think there's really been, a, a, you know, at least a loose consensus that this, this uh, type of use of CRISPR, at least today, for various reasons, uh, shouldn't proceed, at least for now. Right, and we can maybe in the questions we might talk more about this, but um, and then and and furthermore, what's happening today is that the vast majority of work that's going on in terms of clinical development of CRISPR is of the type shown here, called somatic cell editing, and that means editing cells in individuals that are um, that are uh, able to impact the health state or the disease state of the individual but they're not cells that are you know, egg or sperm cells. They're not going to pass the changes on to future generations. And one of the very first examples of the kind of disease that might be treatable with a technology like CRISPR is a very well-characterized genetic disease called sickle cell disease. And so this is a disease that results from a single base pair change in one gene in the human genome. It's a very important gene. It encodes a protein called beta globin that is uh, one of the, the um, proteins that forms hemoglobin that carries oxygen in red blood cells. And so when people inherit two copies of the sickle cell gene, they actually produce a mutated form of beta globin that leads to sickle uh, red blood cells and ultimately to organ failure through a, a number of Typically, these patients will have crises every few weeks where they have terrible pain and organ damage, et cetera. And so although this disease can be diagnosed and it can there's sort of palliative care for these patients, they can receive blood transfusions and things, there wasn't really a way to think about approaching a, a cure for this disease until CRISPR came along. And with CRISPR, we have a technology that now can actually go to the source of a disease like this, and we can imagine a way to provide corrective changes in the genome of a patient that will allow them to produce red, normal red blood cells. And so I want to, I want to just describe um, the, some of the biology behind this. It's very interesting biology, and it also is an example of how I think often in science, a technology or you know any kind of discovery will intersect with other discoveries, and whether they're fundamental science or technological, that allow something to happen or to be done that couldn't have been done before. And that was absolutely true in the case of sickle cell disease. So it turns out that in normal human development, if we look at, at uh, you know, this is a fetus developing, and then when a person is born, and these are months after birth, if you look at the production of proteins that are responsible for producing or making hemoglobin, in red blood cells, what you find is that this protein here, gamma globin, which is a fetal uh, form of hemoglobin, declines over time and it goes down and drops eventually to zero. So this gene gets, is, is, this protein is made during fetal development, but it gets turned off um, close to the time of birth and eventually uh, that protein goes away. And meanwhile, adult form of hemoglobin called beta globin is turned on and this protein starts to be made. So this is what happens normally in human development. But in patients that have two copies of the sickle cell gene, so that's that sickle form, that mutated form of beta globin, within about three months after birth, they can start to experience a, a sickle cell disease symptom. And so that's, that's sort of the you know, high-level physiology of this disease. And furthermore, people like Stuart Orkin and many others have been studying the details of the biology of this and you know, wondering, well, how does fetal hemoglobin get turned off? And they figured out that there's a, a protein called a transcription factor called BCL11A that is responsible for turning off the production of fetal hemoglobin. So this protein gets expressed in, during, during field development, and ultimately it turns off field hemoglobin production, and we start making adult uh, hemoglobin. And so with that biological understanding, when CRISPR came along, there was a very clear opportunity to use CRISPR in its most basic form, which is as a you know, DNA cutting enzyme that can induce 
a little disruptive change in the genome to do the following. And the idea was to, you know, this is now showing a cartoon of this BCL11A transcription factor coding sequence in the genome. And so here's where, you know, this protein is made by um, expression from this position. And there's a, there's a sequence called an enhancer in that region that when disrupted can actually turn off production of this transcription factor. And as I mentioned, that then allows, because that, that protein, which is a repressor, is no longer made, then you can continue to make the hemoglobin. And in fact, it was known that there were some rare cases in the human population of people that, and even though they inherited two copies of the sickle cell gene, they were physiologically normal. They didn't have sickle cell disease. And the reason was that they actually had this type of mutation, right? So they still made fetal hemoglobin, and that could override the effect of the sickle cell mutation. So with CRISPR, the idea was to design an RNA guide that would allow this complex to do exactly the chemistry that I showed you before, but do it right here. And so make a disruptive change in this enhancer of the BCL11A protein uh, coding sequence that would disrupt production of this and thereby allow fetal hemoglobin to make, be made in these patients. That was the idea. And so uh, this went forward as a, initially as an experiment in, in cells that were derived from sickle cell patients. It worked really well. Then it was done in animal models of sickle cell disease. And eventually, it was done in people. And this was sort of the beginning of this era of, you know, uh, sort of starting it now already a few years ago, of what I'll call ex vivo editing, meaning editing, clinical editing of human cells that's done in the lab, where the, the modified cells can then be reintroduced into uh, people. And so for sickle cell disease, the way it works is that a patient can donate their blood for the experiment, and the blood cells are taken out. And in particular, the cells that are desirable for editing in this type of application are stem cells. So these are cells that, from the blood that are blood stem cells. So they can, they're progenitors. They can give rise to mature uh, blood cells in the future. These cells are taken and they're treated with the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, protein RNA complex, which we call a ribonucleoprotein, or an RNP. And that induces the kind of editing that I showed you. So that repressor is turned off, and these cells can now make fetal hemoglobin. And once the editing is performed and the cells are tested to make sure that they're, that they're so they don't have any other changes in the DNA, then those cells can be reintroduced into patients using what is effectively a bone marrow transplant type of procedure. And this has now been performed. This is, the, this is a picture of the very first patients in the United States that received this type of therapy, uh, Virginia uh, uh, Victoria Gray, who's sitting right here. Um, and so Victoria Gray uh, is a woman who lives in Tennessee in the U.S., and she's a sickle cell disease patient. Um, and when I spoke with her, she told me that um, sickle cell disease had really controlled her life forever, you know, since, since she was young. And so she had these crises. She had to go to the hospital frequently. She was having blood transfusions. She had somehow managed to have four children, which is amazing, but she couldn't really, uh, you know, she didn't really have control over her life. And so uh, she's very smart, and she read, had read about CRISPR. And so she asked her doctor if she could get into that initial, that very first clinical trial that was starting. This is already almost five years ago. And one thing led to another, and she was the very first patient to receive the therapy. Imagine how brave you would have to be to say, I'll volunteer to take this untested, you know, therapy that's going to cut my DNA uh, for this disease. But she did. And, um, and fast forwarding, four and a half years later, she hasn't had a single uh, incident of sickle cell disease symptoms since then. One and done therapy, right? One and done. And here's a picture of her taken this uh, March, earlier this year, in London. So she came to the conference on human genome editing, and she explained that this had transformed her life. She's now enrolled in business school. She's starting a clothing company. She doesn't have any more of these crises, and she can just get on with her life. And so as a scientist, for me, this was just so incredible. I felt so emotional when I talked to her because I realized that, you know, this kind of research that started as just very fundamental curiosity-driven science had actually turned into something that could really change 
somebody's life. And she's not alone. So there are now almost three dozen people that have been treated with this type of therapy for sickle cell disease. And every single one of them, I mean, you know, they've been uh, treated at different times. So there, uh, there are different uh, numbers of you know, months that have passed since they received that therapy. But so far, all of those people have had the same benefit. And as a result, we are on the verge of seeing the first CRISPR therapy receive approval from the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, as well as regulatory agencies here in the UK and in Europe. And that's expected to happen in the next couple of weeks, actually. So it's a super exciting moment for the field. I think many of us feel really energized about the potential of this. We can see the possibility. Because if you could do it for sickle cell disease, you could probably do it for lots of other kinds of genetic disorders that have a similar you know, a type of mutation that might cause disease. But uh, we're not done because, in fact, I think we're still at the very beginning. Because, um, because what, what, what's, what, what's so wonderful about CRISPR is also one of the things that's really challenging. It's wonderful that it's a programmable protein, and it's great that it can be personalized for people, um, and it's great that we can use it on cells in the lab and then put those cells back into patients. But um, it's, it makes it difficult to, to, to test clinically. And, um, and it also makes it expensive. And so what we're working on right now, and this is one of the real goals of the Genomics Institute, is to figure out how we're going to make this type of therapy much more widely available and accessible to patients over time by figuring out how we're going to reduce the cost and make it uh, possible for people around the world to benefit from it. Whereas today, you know, this therapy is expected to come in at, you know, a price point of about one and a half million dollars a patient. So it's just, you know, a price point that's not going to work for the vast majority of people. And that's why we as a nonprofit organization, we actually have our own FDA-approved uh, clinical trial for sickle cell disease for that very reason. We want to work on ways of using the technology um, and developing delivery strategies that will avoid the need for a bone marrow transplant, for example, which will really vastly reduce the cost over the time of the therapy. I'll, I'll say more about that maybe shortly. Um, but, you know, where, where is this going in the future? I mean, I think that, you know, when I think about how CRISPR will be deployed for lots of other kinds of diseases, and, you know, by the way, people start to, you know, you, you can easily imagine, you know, in the, even in the early days of the field, people were starting to think about, well, maybe we could use this for cystic fibrosis, which is also a monogenic human disorder. Maybe we could use it for uh, diabetes. Maybe we could use it for um, Huntington's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease that, again, has a single you know, gene that's responsible. So, you know, all these things are you know, very intriguing. Could muscular dystrophy, another example. And in all of those cases, if we really want to be able to do that, we're going to have to develop in vivo genome editing. What in vivo means is just that we'll have to be able to actually deliver these editing molecules directly into the body. Because for lots of those diseases that I just mentioned, it's not going to be possible to take out cells and edit them and then put them back into the patient, right? So that blood disorders are kind of unique in that regard. So this is something that we've been really thinking a lot about. And, you know, today we're at about 250 patients that have been treated with CRISPR in clinical trials of different types. Um, I mentioned to the students uh, yesterday, actually, that if you're curious about this, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is a U.S. Uh, National Institutes of Health site that show you at least in the U.S. some of the trials that are going on. There's a, there's a lot for CRISPR right now. Um, so we're at this level. But if over the next 10 years, you know, it would be great if we could get up to, you know, maybe we can actually help, you know, tens of thousands of patients, you know. And, and if we really want to do that, we're going to have to, get better at the way that we deliver these editors. And just to show you that this is a, you know, it's not, it's not a total fantasy that we're going to be able to do in vivo genome editing. Um, there was another trial that was um, initially announced, I think it was over a year ago now, by a company called Intelia that um, I'm a founder of, but I had absolutely nothing to do with the science. All credit goes to their team, in which they applied CRISPR in a format that allowed it to enter liver cells in a patient through injection. So this is the idea of just getting a one-time injection of CRISPR molecules. And the goal was to edit cells in the liver that in patients that have a rare genetic mutation leads to liver destruction. 
and it's a disease called TTR amyloidosis. And uh, this is a, one of the patients in that, in that initial trial. And um, if, you're, if you have the COVID vaccine, which probably many or most or all of you have done, and you had the mRNA version of it, then you have the same type of formulation because they are using a lipid nanoparticle, which is uh, what was used for the COVID vaccine. And in this case, the formulation allows targeting to the liver and delivery of these CRISPR editors directly into liver cells. And the other thing that was very interesting about that, uh, that trial is that the company was able to show that you could simply change the guide RNA for this type of formulation of CRISPR-Cas9, so the same lipid nanoparticle, same CRISPR-Cas9 protein, different guide RNA that directed it to a different gene in the liver, and they could use it to impact the, uh, a gene that causes a different genetic disorder, shown over here. So it's kind of a really nice example of what you know, sort of makes sense if we understand the biology of CRISPR, because bacteria are doing this all the time. They're reprogramming Cas9 to target different bacteriophage, and here we're using it to target different uh, kinds of genes. And, um, and so at our institute, at the United Genomics Institute, we're really thinking hard about this. And I, these two slides, I'm showing this one and the next one, are from a, one of our scientists, Dr. Ross Wilson, who's been working on this in his own laboratory. And, as I mentioned, this is how the genome editing is being done today for sickle cell disease, where it's done outside the body. The therapy duration takes two months, so a typical bone marrow transplant uh, timeline is, is roughly that long, involving hospitalization. The cost is very high, but imagine that we could change the delivery vehicle either to a lipid nanoparticle or to some other kind of, you know, he's in, Ross's lab, he's actually making chemically modified versions of Cas9 that have cell type specific targeting abilities. And you could deliver these molecules directly by injection into a patient. No bone marrow transplantation required. This could vastly reduce the duration of the therapy and also bring down the cost. So this is something that they're very um, actively working on doing. In our own lab, in my lab, um, for several years now, this has been a project that was led initially by a postdoc, Jenny Hamilton, who came to the lab from a virology background. And um, she wanted to take advantage of what viruses naturally do very well, which is they are very good at infecting specific kinds of cells. And um, in a viral infection, of course, they infect uh, a particular cell type and they inject their genetic material, kind of analogous to what I showed you for bacteriophage. But, um, uh, and this is very effective in terms of you know, cell type specific delivery, but what we really were interested in doing was delivering not genetic material, certainly not for a virus, but, uh, for, but these genome editors. And, and we were particularly excited about the possibility that we could use this kind of viral packaging to deliver pre-assembled Cas9 guide RNA complexes. So these are proteins and RNA that we hoped we could package in these viruses. Um, I told the students when we talked earlier today, uh, uh, earlier that I was going to tell you more about our work on this. I, I changed up my slides a little bit because I, I knew we had some high school students here and I really, really wanted to you know, give a talk that would be accessible to everyone. Uh, so I'm not going to show that uh, work in, in detail, but I'll just say that we have some very exciting work that we're doing right now on the structural biology of these kinds of particles. And Jenny Hamilton has been able to reprogram these kinds of particles to enter different kinds of cells. And we're very excited about the future of this as a way to do targeted genome editing in vivo at programming particles like this to deliver the editors to just those cells that need editing for a particular clinical application. So stay tuned, because I think that's going to be an exciting um, you know, future direction for the field. But at the same time, we really wanted to not only think about this challenge of making genome editing widely accessible, we want to think about it not only from the perspective of science and technology that we need to be doing, but also from the perspective of other kinds of stakeholders that are going to influence this process. And um, this is a, an effort that's been led by Melinda Kligman at the Innovative Genomics Institute who is our director of public impact, and she has uh, colleagues that are working with her 
And they put together a task force that met over about a year and a half to really dig into this issue of you know, possible solutions to genomic medicine access. How are we going to deal with this challenge of reducing the cost and making it available to, to people? And they came up with four general approaches that, four general steps that need to be taken. First of all, that we need to think about um, a pricing structure for these therapies that is dynamic in the sense that there's not one price that everybody has to pay, but there's a, there's a scale to the price that is perhaps, um, you know, linked to the, uh, the GDP of the country the person's from, or something like that. Secondly, we needed to think about innovation with manufacturing because, as we know, you know, we're biochemists working in the lab and we work with purified proteins and we're comfortable doing that and making RNA, but if you want to take those molecules and put them into a person, they have to be produced in a very specific fashion. And of course, they have to be very clean, very pure, and that can get expensive quickly and it can be hard to scale. But we have ideas there about how we can improve manufacturing. So that's the second thing. Thirdly, we have to think creatively about licensing of intellectual property so that countries and other companies can get access to the licensing and patents that they would need to have to develop these therapies broadly. And then finally, we wanted to investigate creative ways of partnering academic and nonprofit groups with companies and even uh, sort of interesting companies like public benefit corporations that are a little bit of a sort of a, almost the combination of a nonprofit or a for profit kind of organization. And we're doing all of this. If anybody's interested in this report, uh, you can find it here. You can check it out our website for this. And uh, we're actually writing up a, a, a perspective for Nature Magazine right now that they asked us to write on the eve of this CRISPR approval to really talk about these subjects because now it seems very immediate, right? We've got a great therapy, but we've got to figure out how we're going to make it more available to people. So this is just uh, a slide from Melinda at our institute that just kind of illustrates several steps that need to be taken in the path from where we are today over here uh, with sickle cell therapies to ultimately getting to an affordable cure for sickle cell. And it really just involves starting with where, we are, where we're at with this ex vivo type of a therapy and then working with the community, working with regulators, working with companies, and working, of course, with scientists to figure out how we're going to create better technology and better ways of producing it and regulating it so that it can be uh, more widely available. And finally, I'm just going to end by talking very, just mentioning very briefly other impacts of CRISPR on the human health, uh, you know, challenges in human health, but also the health of our planet. And this is really a project that has emerged over the last couple of years at the Innovative Genomics Institute, focusing on taking CRISPR back to its origins. And that means using it in microbes, and not just individual microbes, but using it in microbiomes. So these are the communities of microbes that populate our bodies and our planet, and are really responsible for you know, much of the, 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 the planetary ecosystem. And uh, we sort of imagine that you, know, you could use CRISPR to make targeted changes in, you know, say, a single gene of a single type of organism, but within the context of a complex population of, of bugs. And we started, we, my lab initially started doing this with Jill Banfield, and then more recently we've been able to raise some philanthropic support to hire a number of younger scientists who are doing this type of work in two settings. One is to edit the human gut microbiome. And this is a project we have in collaboration with UC San Francisco, and we're starting off by working in asthma as a, a disease that is connected to the microbiome, and we'd, of course, like to expand it to other microbiome-connected disorders. And then in livestock, we're doing this uh, work to edit the cow lumen microbiome, which is surprisingly um, important in the production of methane, one of the most powerful greenhouse gases. And um, the idea there is to reduce methane production in cattle and do it in a fashion that's inexpensive and that we can work with farmers in countries around the world to make uh, widely available. And these are some of the folks that are doing this work. This is Spencer, Ben, Brady, and we just hired another scientist, Carlotta Ronda, joining the team. We've hired them into non-tenure track positions, but they have, their, they have uh, 
They're principal investigators. They run groups. They have students. They have postdocs. They have generous funding, and they have, importantly, a collaborative lab. So they have a collaborative lab, and we've hired them telling them, we want to reward you for collaboration, and we want to reward you for working as a team and figuring out how you're going to tackle these really big challenges in microbiome editing and do it in a way that will lead to real-world solutions to these problems. So it's a really interesting um, experiment, I guess, in sort of doing academic science in a different way. So I'm just going to close by pointing out that, as I told you, these RNA-guided CRISPR-Cas proteins are incredibly useful for not only sort of programmable genome editing, but all kinds of genetic manipulations that we can now target to particular sequences because we know how to control the activity of these proteins. We know from clinical trials that this type of strategy for treating disease or even curing disease can be safe and effective, um, but we now have to figure out how to expand its use and make it uh, widely available over time. And that's, I think, really what the next decade of CRISPR is going to be about. Right? It's really going to be about uh, developing it and expanding its use. And I want to thank uh, an, an amazing team of scientists. This was uh, taken at a lab retreat where we had all of our undergraduate students, our technicians, uh, students that are, uh, you know, associated with the my lab in any way. All of them used to go to Sonoma Valley, and it was a lot of fun. And, um, and I, uh, of course, are, are, we're, we're incredibly grateful to the agencies that have funded our research. I couldn't have done this without Harvard Medical Institute support, and also, importantly, uh, the National Science Foundation in the United States, because they gave us a little grant in the beginning that allowed the very first CRISPR biology unit to get going in our lab. And finally, I'll just thank the organizations that I'm affiliated with in the Bay Area of California, and these are some of the companies that I'm a part of as well. I thank you all. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for a fantastic and uh, inspiring talk. I'd like to um, give people in the audience a chance to ask questions. And we have some microphones. Or I can uh, repeat the question. Yeah, or you can repeat the question. Say your question. Yeah. This one? Right here. Okay. Not, not the way I showed you. And that's been shown definitively, right? So in those experiments, like with those initial clinical trial patients, they actually looked at their germ cells to see if they were modified, and they are not. Yeah. Right. So in, in, in the activation cattle is not even editing cattle cells, right? It's editing bacterial cells that are in the cattle brain. Yes, but um, that's, that's right. You have to do it in, in each, each cow. But, you, but the idea that we're working on, and this is with a really great collaborative team at the University of California, Davis, which is a, an agricultural, you know, has a very strong agri agricultural program. There is a group there that has shown that you can manipulate the cow microbiome to reduce methane emissions. They're doing it currently with diet, but that's really not sustainable. It's not a you know, it's not affordable for people. We want to do it with microbiome editing. So the idea would be to do the editing very early in the, in, when the calf is born to change the microbial population permanently that would allow reduced or even eliminated methane production. Question here. Thank you. Um, great talk. It's very clear. Fascinating. Is it in principle possible to use CRISPR to insert into, say, a human cell, CRISPR mechanisms for fighting viruses? Yes, that is. And in fact, um, that's been done with cells in the lab. So in the laboratory, people have made, in fact, they've even made things like transgenic mice, 
that you know have Cas9 protein being produced from their genome, and then you can just add a guide RNA and boom, you get eggs, right? So, um, but um, if you're thinking that hey, that might be a great uh, new immune system for human beings, um, you know, I guess the other sort of corollary question would be how come humans don't have a CRISPR gene? And I think that you know we don't really know. But my hypothesis is that. This is a system that is very rapidly evolving, and it, it evolves. Well, you know, I didn't have time to get into all the really cool biology of CRISPR and you know the way that bacteriophage fight back against it, but they do. And so I think that it works in a setting where you have rapidly divided cells to keep up with rapidly reproducing viruses. But when you have cells that are growing slowly, like say our cells, I think it's a lot harder for those types of systems to be effective. The first question I want to touch a little bit about our target efficiency. We know that's a very important issue. And in clinical trials, we know that human genetic variants may change the whole of target landscape. So in this case, may I have your thoughts, comments, and solutions? Right, so off-target editing is referring to when you, you could imagine that, you know, suppose that RNA guide lands in a, uh, at a, an unintended site in the genome, and you get, you know, editing that occurs uh, in an undesired position. Could that cause problems? People have been thinking about this from the very beginning, but, right? And there's a, now a vast literature on this if you look in the, you know, scientific publications. And I think what's emerged is that you can absolutely observe off-target editing with CRISPR-Cas, but typically that's from experiments that are done with a really, um, you know, overproduction of the CRISPR-Cas protein, so it's present in very high concentrations in cells. And a lot of times the cells that are studied for those experiments are cancer cells, right? They're not sort of normal primary cells. And so what's happened in clinical trials is that uh, people have looked quite deeply by sequencing at what happens with off-target editing. So like, for example, in all of those CRISPR, uh, the clinical trials with, with sickle cell disease, that's been the type of uh, analysis that was done with those patient cells. And it turns out that it's very difficult, actually, to find off-target edits in those cells. And it's probably a combination of uh, the cells are primary cells, the stem cells, and they're also being treated with a, a limited amount of the editor. And by the way, I didn't get a chance to tell you, but in those uh, trials, they're actually using the the, the assembled Cas9 protein with its RNA guide. It's not introduced as a, you know, reproducing virus or something like that. So it goes in and edits and then it gets um, kicked out or, you know, destroyed. Or something. So it's not around to do a lot of off-target editing. So I think today you're right that it's an important thing to monitor and you have to always be thinking about it, but I don't see that today as a bottleneck for this type of therapy. Thank you. Uh, if I can ask the second question very briefly. So you mentioned about we can, uh, we currently we are applying CRISPR for BMD for Huntington. So my question is, when do you think is the bad timing for um, aging related diseases using CRISPR? Uh, okay. Because we are talking about the future of CRISPR. Do you think now is the bad time or when we saw the bottle, bottleneck, um, et cetera? Of targeting Did you say aging? Aging? Yeah, aging related. Aging related? Yeah. yeah. Uh, boy, I'd love to have some aging related. <laughs> Let's mitigate aging. That sounds great. Um, I think the challenge with CRISPR is, you know, I, I tried to highlight in the in the talk that you know, a lot of the clinical applications that are contemplated currently are monogenic disorders, right? They're diseases that are clearly the result of a single gene in the human genome that's mutated. But for lots of things, and I think aging would be in this category probably, there are many, many genes we can change. And we don't know what they all are. And, and so I think that's going to be a much harder challenge. I think there, the, the frontier of that kind of biology is frankly in the research realm, where CRISPR can be used to interrogate the function of genes or the function of many genes at once and try to figure out how they're working. And there's a lot of that type of research going on. I think that has to happen before we're going to be able to use it in the clinical trials. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question, and there's a question in the back row. We can get a microphone back there. Thank you. Thank you, George. I can, I can move through.
Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Becky. And so, um, and it, it just, it really has to do, it's really more of a, I would say it's more of a technical capability question, okay? So, in the early days of CRISPR, the very first capability with CRISPR was that you could infuse it in its natural native form for cut DNA and induce a small change in a DNA sequence. And people, you know, were using this for gene disruption. And so the question was, huh, is there a gene disruption application that will work for sickle cell disease. And it's, it's the one I showed you, right, where you can disrupt production of that repressive protein when you get little hemoglobin made. But, um, but you're absolutely right that an alternative would simply be to let's just correct that disease-causing mutation. To do that, we need to use CRISPR in a mode where it induces an assertion of a little corrective sequence into the beta globin gene. That's being done, and in fact, Jacob Korn, who's at the ETH now, but used to be with us at Innovation Management Institute, he was there. He actually uh, worked on a therapy with CRISPR for sickle cell disease that does exactly that. And in fact, that's the format of, of, of CRISPR that we're using in our clinical trial. But our trial is an actual gene correction. So you can do both. In the very back row. Um, so the question I had, it relates to um, uh, the evolution of the tracer and its relationship to the ev evolution of Cas uh, proteins and um, your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's in, I, I, lo I love this aspect of CRISPR, and I didn't have time to talk about it tonight, but we're doing a lot of work on kind of thinking about the coevolution of these pathways because they are fundamentally, they are RNA protein complexes that have to work together. Right? And in the case of CRISPR-Cas9 that I showed you tonight, it's, an, it's a protein that normally uses these two RNAs. And this is actually was work from Emmanuel Charpentier originally, is that she found that, that um, when those CRISPR RNAs are made to you know, work with Cas9, the tracer RNA is made in a single copy in the genome. There's a little you know, um, gene that makes the tracer RNA. And that RNA is made in high levels. It's made at a very high level so that you have enough of those little tracers that they go around and they base pair with each unit of that CRISPR repetitive sequence. I hope this is making sense. And they allow the cell to cut that RNA, the CRISPR RNA, into the little segments that work with tracer. And so it's a, a very, it's almost like sort of an efficient way to have a guide, you know, that you know, you have these guide RNAs coming from this repetitive element where you have lots of different guides that are encoded there, but you've got to figure out how to chop that long piece of RNA into shorter functional units that each have the tracer associated, and that's how they do it. But it turns out there's lots of variations on this theme. Some CRISPR-Cas proteins use a single uh, guide RNA naturally, like they have one guide. Um, and um, sometimes they flip around the orientation of the RNA. So there's all kinds of little, you know, interesting variations that happen over evolutionary time. And we're currently working on some of that because I think it's fascinating. Is the microphone nice enough? Yes, sure. Uh, and the question is, what are the bottlenecks for scaling the technology today? Or probably the other way to ask this question, if you had uh, an unlimited budget, and the purpose to uh, increase healthy human lifespan. How do you, how would you spend it? So we're we're, we're back to we're back to aging. Are we back to yeah, aging? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, totally. I'm doing aging for ten years. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I think you're, maybe you're asking more generally, like what, what are the maybe what are the bottlenecks right now? Yeah. Yeah. What's the clinical application? Yeah. I really I really think it's about the work. I do, because I think that. You know, when you think about how this is going to have impact in a lot of people. Today, I mean, it's very exciting. We're all excited and hoping and waiting for this, you know, clinical approval of the therapy. But frankly, it's not going to help that many people today because it's too expensive and it's too hard on the body and it takes too long. And, you know, people in most countries are not going to be able to produce to a, you know, bone marrow transplant. It's just, it's not going to work. So I think we have to be moving towards a different era. That's why I have my in vivo editing era on, on 
slide because I think that that's the future, right? So I imagine a day when we have perhaps a whole toolbox of, edi of, of editing tools plus delivery vehicles. I don't think it's going to be one solution. It'll probably be a whole bunch that allow you to target particular kinds of cells. Now, somebody asked me the other day, why do we need to target particular cells? Maybe we just need an editor, you know, delivery that gets into every cell, right? The problem there is think how much editor you have. It's a lot, right? And for most diseases, you don't need to edit every single type of cell. You just need to edit one type. So I really think it's about targeting. There's a question right here. Thank you. Amazing talk. Two quick questions. The first one is, how did they target uh, the liver in that example that you showed? Like, because it's a nanoparticle, how did they do it so efficiently? Second question, related to the cattle and the human gut. How would you maintain the microbiome, like the modified microbiome intact? Because you could get probably good poisoning and then bye-bye. And it's in my profile. <laughs> and then how would then you would have to restart again and that would cost more money, I guess. Yeah. So the first question, how do you target the liver? Well it turns out that you know the liver is an organ that lots of things traffic to naturally, right? So you know you're sort of you sort of have a natural advantage with that. And these lipid nanoparticles, that's where they tend to end up, right? You don't have to do anything special. And they go, they mostly go to the liver. So that's why liver is one of the organs, along with blood and the eye, that are kind of the three organs that are being initially targeted with CRISPR because we have ways of targeting those types of cells right now, right? So maybe in the future that'll change, but that's, that's sort of the situation. With regard to your second question about, you know, how, let's imagine that you could edit the microbiome, but how are you going to maintain it over time? So this is, a, this is a very active area of research that you've seen, right? Because it's a great question. How are you going to do that? And their ideas are really, I think, very interesting. And, and they're thinking about nutritional ways of maintaining the modified microbiome. They're thinking about ways of making the modified bugs in this, you know, in the modified microbiome dependent on a particular vitamin that you might uh, have people taking, you know, things like that, right? So we're thinking about nutritional ways, very simple nutritional ways that you could maintain with that edited microbiome in advance. Tony? Potentially, it could uh, reduce the effectiveness of the rejuvenation. That means the cattle would then get fed as well in terms of much nutrition. And then also with the um, treatment of clothing, you know, the tail off of that must be for a reason because in the room it could be doing it. But it doesn't mean that the individual, as they get older, perhaps is not going to be as efficient and they can come to them. But, you know, can you identify this as a way, or is it just through things like that? Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. So. Uh, maybe thinking about the the, uh, the hemoglobin example. I mean, I think there, you know, people wondered in the early days of those trials whether the patients that were treated would have some kind of, you know, first of all, would the editing be, be persistent? Would you really see these edited cells thriving in, in the patients? And secondly, would you see some kind of health defect in, in these people over time? And so far, the answer is no and no, right? So we really don't find evidence for uh, any detriment to their health with this type of editing. Now, will that be true for every clinical application? You know, I think it's not clear. And, you know, um, this is where, you know, this is one of the real challenges in the field right now with regulators is trying to figure out what's the right way to test and regulate these applications in a way that, you know, doesn't impede progress, but also make sure that they're safe over time. And I don't, I don't know that there's an easy answer to that, but we're, at our institute, this is one of the things I'm really actively working on, is we have a very active, ongoing conversation with people at the FDA, because we help educate them about the science, and then we learn from them what their concerns are, and then we try to anticipate and work on making, um, you know, creating pipelines that we think will make it easier. And your first, the first part was, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so but the, 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 here's an interesting, I didn't have time to mention this, but one of the ways that people are thinking about that 
is using CRISPR for what's called epigenomics. And the idea there is that you make changes to DNA that are not covalent, so they're not permanent, but they affect the output of particular genes. And those can persist over you know, many generations of cells, but in principle, they're also reversible. Yeah. Obviously, the most efficient way to address human genetic disease is to modify the DNA and then add uh, sperm or, or eggs. And obviously, that does raise these ethical questions. I mean, do you see that in the future? One day, this technology being applied to that, or is it just uh, too big an ethical question to address? Well, Speaking for myself, just me personally, I absolutely think that will happen. I do. I think it will. And, um, you know, I, I think it will I think it'll happen sooner than we think, you know, and because and, the technology does continue to advance very quickly. In fact, there are some really good scientists uh, right here in the community in the UK that are doing, you know, I think very interesting work on human embryo genome editing or CRISPR to try to really understand, you know, how does DNA repair work in that setting? You know, what's safe to do in terms of targeting. And I think that's the kind of research that needs to happen so that we can understand the, you know, the technology, how the technology works. But then the other question is, which genes do we edit and which, where is there a need that really can't be addressed any other way than by germline editing? And today, I think, you know, at least if you're thinking about real diseases, like genetic diseases, it's pretty rare. You know, that somebody inherits two copies of a, two alleles of a, you know, disease-causing gene. Um, I mean, sickle cell is, is, is kind of a somewhat, you know, unique example. But, um, and, you know, with in vitro fertilization and embryo selection and that kind of thing, you could imagine mitigating genetic disorders in, in, in that fashion. But they are, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, you know, to me, the, the more likely, well, I don't want to say more likely, but I think, so that's one scenario, is that there are diseases that you want to mitigate using germline editing. But, but I think what will happen at some point is that the technology will, will be at a stage where it's safe and effective, and then people say, okay, now I want to use it to, um, you know, make uh, changes to my kids that I think will give them some kind of advantage, right? make them taller, make them better athletes, make, right, these kinds of things. And I think, you know, we're laughing because I think today that's not happening, but, but I think it could over the next couple of decades. I think that's a real possibility. And so this is one of the reasons I'm really encouraging active discussion and, and transparency about the technology because I don't think it's a good idea that we spring this on everybody, right? I think it's, we have to be grappling with these challenges right now because it, it's coming and we're going to have to answer those questions. Yeah, it was a gene called CCR5 that is um, involved in HIV infection. And so the, the justification for that work was that, you know, the scientists claimed that he was trying to protect these babies from HIV transmission during birth. But you may know that there are other ways of mitigating against HIV infection that are very well, you know, well, you know, worked out and, and are quite safe. So I think people can see that it's just really not ethical to do what he has done. Question there, and maybe there. Hi, uh, just coming back to the in vivo delivery. Um, so, um, thinking about delivery to organs such as brain or heart, so challenging ones. Um, where do you think the future really lies? What do you think can be the, the winning horse? I guess you mentioned adenoviruses. You mentioned LMPs. Maybe some other type of particles. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a number of technologies that are either already developed or are coming along that I think will start to address those kinds of more challenging organs for targeting, like the brain. And um, I'll just give, I can just give you an example from our own work. So we actually just, um, me as the, the royal lead here, this is a big uh, group of scientists that you know, I'm part of that involves many others, including clinicians, that are using CRISPR in the brain. And right now we're doing it in, in animal models, both pigs and mice where we're using um, a, a couple of different ways of targeting neurons in the brain for, you know, 
cell type specific editing. And it's done, we're using, a, you mentioned AAB, which is a viral vector that can be um, engineered to enter uh, brain cells. And we can also use the um, modification, modified proteins that Ross Wilson is working on that I mentioned also for, for brain editing. So we're doing that work. And um, the hope there is that we can get to a point where we can show that it's efficacious to do that for disease under those animal models. And then, of course, we, you know, hand in hand, we have to figure out how, how we're going to do the manufacturing that will produce enough that we could actually do it in, in a big context like that for human animals. There's one question here. Um, hi. So in terms of, like, the future of CRISPR stuff, um, sorry, that didn't sound very scientific. But, um, <laughs> Just, I know, like, right now, do you think down the line there'll be any problems in terms of, like, inducing, like, double strand breaks? Because I know there's been other techniques like, like ACE or prime editing that does genomic editing without inducing that. So I just wonder if you could comment on that a little bit. Right. So I, um, I didn't have time to show you tonight, but one of the things we've been working on in the lab is the precision of editing, especially after double strand breaks. And we know from that work, and not only ours, but other people too, that you know, double-stranded breaks occasionally can, can induce genome, um, um, you know, chromosome loss and things like that. And but we also know how to, how to mitigate against that as well. So there's, you know, there's a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a back and forth there. Understanding what's happening and then understanding how we can, can, can mitigate it. But I think that uh, you brought up uh, other modes of editing, like using CRISPR-Cas9 as a base editor or as a prime editor, and these are ways of inducing targeted changes in genomes that don't, in principle, involve a double-stranded break. I think they are really interesting ideas. I think they can be very effective in research applications. I'm not convinced yet that they're going to be good clinical applications, at least the way they're working today. Because if you look in the, you know, you have to look at the, uh, you know, the fine print, <laughs> right, the details of what's happening, those actually induce a number of undesired editing events that happen, um, not, not really off target, but they're um, in addition to getting the, you know, say a, a nucleotide changing with base editing, it turns out you can also get the kinds of indels that I showed at the same time. And I don't think people really understand mechanistic of what's going on in there, but, you know, it's not quite as uh, precision as, as one might like. It may get there someday, for sure, but it's, I don't think it's quite there yet. I know there's a lot more questions, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to cut up there. I'm really sorry. Uh, but thank you again, Jennifer, for a really inspiring talk about your story and going from a really fundamental basic biology all the way through to clinic. It was, it was fantastic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.